can you tell us more about the project that you worked on during your internship at Adobe? Actually, I do have a Medium article, which I think might might be better just to quickly go over the kind of my learnings, the high level learnings, because there's some like specific things that I can't really talk about. I think it's it's interesting because what we were working on was kind of what Adobe was looking into, like the future of creative tools, which, you know, like not necessarily replace existing tools, but more like cater towards a different audience or market because, you know, Photoshop, the existing suites are very high. There's a high learning curve. And we're trying to leverage AI and ML to use as a kind of creative a collaborative tool to even help you know new designers to unlock new creative ability without you having to be super proficient in the tool itself so in the nature of like the team we we kind of like had to think outside the box a little bit because it was all actually yeah i can start by like going into kind of um like this is kind of a medium article that I wrote as a reflection after my internship and kind of at a high level, like some of the, the very like difficult constraints are um, there is a new way of understanding AI and ML design just because, you know, machine learning is, it's also, there's like two reasons. One being it's kind of a concept hard to grasp by designers, first of all, because it's very technical, you know, traditionally designers are not really exposed to that. So on the one hand, we have to work with these like technical constraints, but also these these things are evolving every day, right? Like machine learning kind of, it's improving and, but also there's a misconception that like, you know, AI refers to a huge umbrella of, of things. And we were specifically focused on like GANs, which is generative um, adversarial networks, which is for image generation. Um, I mean, they also, you can also use it for like video, but we were focused specifically on images because, you know, Adobe was looking more at like kind of the visual aspect of things. Um, and images are kind of easier to start with. And um, so, yeah, actually, first of all, like for many people, machine learning is, the, is a buzzword. And we realized that we definitely need new vocabularies when we we're talking about it. And because there's a lot of, you know, pop culture really like, popular popularize it but ultimately there's a black box and like I think as a UX designer our goal is to un, kind of unwrap that box to reveal to the users maybe like what's some of what's going behind the scenes even though it can be a tangled mess at times and um and another thing is looking at like what machine learning is good at which is kind of exploring the latent space and so these are like kind of variations and um kind of ex also showing to the user what those variations are and also like how can we understand what the user wants. So there is that communication gap there, like because the machine learns over time and we need a lot of data to learn from and that data comes from user feedback. But how do we even get that user feedback in the first place um, without the user being too like fatigued? You know, we don't want to show forms to them all the time. So, you know, even from this, you can see that, like, I had a really hard time grasping my head yeah. around all these constraints in the beginning. And my manager was literally like, here are these reading materials. Um, I'm going to give you a few weeks to, like, figure out what you want to do. And then if you're really struggling, let me know. So the first few weeks, I was really struggling. And, you know, the design process is, like, a constant kind of iteration for me, like, kind of a, a tangled ball for me like there's a lot of thoughts going into my head I realized I could be working on so many things but at the same time I was limited because I only had like two and a half three months so you know how do you how do I scope down the problem enough also to work within the constraints but also it is something that's like interesting to me it's really hard because I had very like broad scope and there were so many things that were interesting to me um, and I presented so many ideas to my manager and I thought we have like these weekly critique sessions or feedback sessions. And um, what I learned over time was I was just too broad. Like every week I was just too broad. So I had to narrow and narrow and narrow down. And, and yeah, like I think um, this is the article itself is a more high level understanding, but for me personally, ultimately I, I um, landed on, designing the kind of the feedback loop 
which is at the core, it's, it's more of a conversation between a machine and the user. Uh, if you think about like, what's the best way to communicate um, and iterate upon that. Um, so yeah, so I did a lot of research in, in regarding to like GAN, so I had to understand like, you know, what do you need to know from the beginning, the user intent of what they want to build or what they want to create? And then how do you like step-by-step step try to understand or unpack the user intent over time? Because the user also changes their intents, right? Like you you may decide that your maybe maybe your design sense has changed. Maybe your like likes and wants have changed and you have to be able to cater towards that. So there's like a lot of these factors in, in mind. And I think like it was harder because the user research methods um, are slightly different because you know all the existing design methods I learned were for more like known answers and because machine learning I have no idea what the kind of the machine thinks sometimes there's a lot of uncertainty too and and yeah so that that was definitely like a big struggle but in the end I think um, I learned a lot about just the way to design for machine learning is also kind of designing for the human too, because um, there can be a lot of ethical issues involved when you're kind of regarding like data or biases. I think I can go into that like more if anyone's interested, but I think at a high level, um, because like I think sometimes I can feel myself just like talking to the details and then like losing who I'm talking to. Um, but yeah. This is extremely new. People are going to find this super insightful. And I think it's, yeah, actually, if, if anyone's interested, I have a couple of resources where I can point you. And because this, this field is super new, like when I was um, interning, I didn't find like too many resources. Like not, you know, I can't really look for medium for existing case studies. I know Google Pair, like which is their AI design department, just came out with a design guide. I know Microsoft's working on it. Like, Facebook has something similar, but it's still very new. And there are more guidelines than like very specific, like, you know, heuristics or like kind of design processes in place. So it's still very exciting where you can kind of think about your user's need and what technology you're working with and create your own process. Right. And I think that's the, that's the beauty about being like um, a UX designer, I think, because it's really depending on the context that you're working in. And for me, design tools are more like just your, not like mandatory, but more, they're just a toolkit, you know, just like, you know, all these creative tools are toolkits that to enable you to do something, you're enable you to get to your end goal. So it's up to you to decide what's part of your toolkit in this case. And part of you, it's like up to you to decide what your scope is and like what your metrics is. And, and yeah, actually, I'm really interested in like design and ethics uh, within kind of AI design. And actually, I did my thesis project on like data set bias for image data sets. And, and yeah, I think this is a, a topic that more designers should be invested in, because right now it's still very academic in, you know, the computer science world. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think design has a huge impact on the future of like technology being built. But how can we do that if we don't insert ourselves you know like to try to understand that space i think yeah that, that's where i think like the really interesting part will be is like when we truly are able to determine from the beginning how like maybe even how products being built you know how the algorithm is um designed and how the data set is sourced so these are conversations we have at on my team at adobe a lot is like for example where do we collect the data from? And, you know, it's a huge issue, like, because machine learning, you need data, but our promise, Adobe's promise to the user now is like, they don't actually collect the, the data. They don't know what you're working on, um, but that might change if we need the data to create those, these like tools. So, so yeah, I think a lot of it is just conversations about like, high level things, you know, just blue sky, like how can we deal with, you know, what if a user uses this for, you know, like to create child pornography, you know, this tool that can create such like amazing images. Um, and is it Adobe's responsibility to stop that? Or, 
or even like if people are creating like you know fake currency how can you detect that so there's a lot of this kind of future thinking uh where we brainstorm like potential kind of doomsday scenarios we call it so like <laughs> the worst case scenario like I, I really think it's our responsibility as designers to consider for those cases as well as the good ones you know because we know like you know things kind of get abused tools get abused all the time and and yeah so I think that's like what was super interesting for me is not only am I part of like kind of on my own design project we're also having these larger conversations as a team that's great uh, and super insightful i feel people will find like this will be a lot of very interesting to learn from